her hands together for my friend, Leslie McCurdy. I've been angry with my parents since I was seven. They argued all the time. They yelled and screamed and fought physically. Sometimes I would grab on my mother's shirt or bang on her legs and say, stop the argumenting, stop the argumenting. But they didn't. I was really afraid one time when my mom threw the cast iron frying pan across the room at my dad. The handle broke off. We used it like that for a long time. There were injuries. Um, my mom had her arm in a sling after falling down the stairs once. She had a black eye. My father had a broken arm, only it wasn't caused by my parents' fights, but it was aggravated when my mother grabbed it and shook it because she didn't believe that the reason why he was away all night was because he had gotten a flat tire on the highway coming back from Toronto and had broken his arm trying to change it. She grabbed it. I still remember his scream. I was late for school almost every day, even though we lived right next door, because of all the shit that went on every morning, same shit every day. My father coming to the bathroom when my mother was trying to bathe, my sisters and I, and saying, out! And my mother saying, Howard, you just can't come in here while I'm trying to get the kids ready for school. And my father saying, out! And my mother saying, why can't you get up earlier? So, Because you know I have to get the kids ready in the morning. And she'd hustle us out, finish dressing us out elsewhere. And then when my father came out of the bathroom, every single day, he left his dirty underwear on the floor, just in front of the dirty clothes hamper. Every single day. And of course, my mother would fuss about that again. And even at the age of seven, I could tell he was doing that shit on purpose. <laughs> Once I was so anguished by the morning routine that I curled up in a corner outside of my classroom at school crying until my teacher came and brought me in. I liked school, at least it was a refuge. There was a ditch beside our house that was maybe, I don't know, about so wide and across that ditch was a pole, maybe about so round and across that pole, across that ditch is where one earned their props in my neighborhood. If you couldn't walk across that pole, you were a punk. And my siblings and I not only walked it, we walked backwards, we ran it, we did cartwheels. We were gymnasty, and um, so we ruled the pole, and whoever ruled the pole ruled the neighborhood, and as I was the oldest, I was sort of in charge, and the rule in our neighborhood was to get along. Although we did have some run-ins. Um, you know, we didn't grow up around a lot of black people. Canada is, after all, the great white north. And my, my sister Linda came home from school one day and told my mother that a friend of hers had said to her, my mommy told me to tell you that you're a nigger. And she asked, what's a nigger? Mom said, if anyone calls you that again, you push them down. Just push them down. <laughs> we pushed a few times. Mm -hmm. Seemed that was that. My parents were um, civil rights workers. On both sides of my family, I come from long lines of proud, hardworking people. And no insult was to be tolerated. I remember my mom forged a path to our school because she wasn't happy about what we were being taught about Africa. Um, and whenever we had history projects to do, she would direct us towards black heroes and sheroes. That's where my Harriet Tubman thing came from. Uh, she and some friends of hers started something called um, the Panel of Concerned Women that had an exhibit called From Slavery to Freedom that was the precursor of the North American Black Historical Museum that exists in Amherstburg, Ontario today. And my father started something called the Windsor Black Coalition that was eventually expanded to the National Black Coalition of Canada, which he headed. And there was a time when there was a lot of activity going on in our house and people were coming in and out and people were speaking in sort of hushed, frightened tones because a cross had been burned on the front yard of my great uncle's house in Amherstburg over a, a struggle nearby to desegregate a nearby school. And I remember people like Dick Gregory used to come to our house. Uh, well the fight to desegregate Ontario's golf courses was being waged from there. I remember him in particular because he only drank distilled water. And I used to be able to go with my father to make some at his laboratory at the University of Windsor where he was a microbiology professor. My father was the first black tenured professor in Canada. Yeah. 
and I loved going to, with him to his laboratory. I can still remember the smell. And those were really special times with my dad at his lab when I still thought I wanted to grow up to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And occasionally my parents would have parties at the house, I guess, to release some of the pressure and all the people that worked with them and their civil rights activities would come to them. And I remember uh, we'd get to go down for a few minutes and I would imitate this little funny dance move my dad would always make. When my parents divorced, they did not do so nicely. First my mom moved out the house, then my dad, and they were back and forth, in and out. We had cousins of my father's coming to stay with me. And they kind of had parties and things going on half the time. And with my parents, there was a lot of arguing and fighting and stupid things like forgetting us time and time again at gymnastics or track and field until way too late, waiting for a ride. Everything around us already closed up for the night. It seemed they were caught up in their own crap and really were only interested in us and in as much as they could manipulate us to, to try and hurt each other. I remember asking once, can't you guys just get along? Can't you be civil for the sake of your, your children? Guess not. They didn't have books back then to, on how not to destroy your children while you were divorcing. High school had its own drama as uh, I fought to fit in. My sister and Linda and I being two thirds of the black students out of 1500 at our school. And we had friends that felt comfortable saying things in front of me like, hey, anyone want to hear a nigger joke? <laughs> they didn't think of me as one of those black people. And I didn't trust friendships much anyways because my mother had always told me that I really didn't have many friends, just hangers on who hung out with me to bask in my spotlight because I was so good at so many things. What, they couldn't like me for me? What was wrong with me? And then through all this, I called myself trying to protect my, my siblings from the stupidity of my parents. When it was decided that my mom was, would stay with us, she was able to get a job at a college that was being built near to us. And that took a lot of her time. And the clubs and the meetings that she was going to took a lot of our time. So a lot of our time, we were alone, my siblings and I. We had babysitters, live-in nannies. Um, a lot of them were from the Caribbean, because my mother helped Caribbean women immigrate to Canada when Canada opened her borders to black women to come and work as domestics. Others were people that she found in the wad ads from the newspaper. And I always wondered why she had, had them. My sister and Linda and I, we seemed to be handling the job of raising a, our siblings, our younger siblings. We didn't seem to need them around. One of them actually held me hostage in her room for hours, um, holding a gun to her house, her head, threatening to kill herself if I didn't listen to her read her autobiography. I hated that shit. <laughs> when my parents finally, oh, my siblings and I also had a lot of activities that we were involved in. Um, I wanted to be a dancer, so there was dance for me and my sisters. I, I always thought my sister Linda wanted to be an ice skater, not a dancer, but I was the oldest, so they had to follow me. We did gymnastics three, four nights a week, and in the summer track and field four to six nights a week, and it was baseball I did for fun, and my little brother also had football and hockey, and we weren't allowed just to participate in everything. We had to be the best. Uh, my father would say, it's, it's tough being a, a black man in a white man's world, and you're gonna have to be twice as good in order to be considered equal. And I wasn't allowed to be equal. I had to set the standard which I really didn't mind because I loved the competition and I loved being the best at everything I did and I loved the approval that I got from my dad. When the divorce was final, my mother decided that she wanted to move to Lansing, Michigan to finish um, her master's degree. And at first I didn't want to move because I had just made a friend at my school and, and things were going well. So I asked my dad if, if he would you know, arrange it so that I could stay with him. And he was happy to do that because he was really worried about the move. Um, I was on a trajectory at that time to win uh, a major award, um, uh, the top um, academic athletic award in Windsor uh, when I finished grade 13. And going to Lansing meant that there was no grade 13 and it was gonna sort of mess up my, my, my career path. You know, so my dad had no problem trying to fight mom so that I could stay with him. Only my mother said that we should go and check out Place before we made any decisions. So my sister Lynn and I took a, a trip to Lansing, high, uh, to Lansing, Michigan, to our new high school, Everett High School, home of Irving Magic Johnson. <laughs> the year they won the championship. <laughs> when we arrived at Everett, 
Magic Johnson was our personal ambassador for the day. And there was a banner hanging up over the front of the school, seriously, that said, welcome to the Canadian athletes. <laughs> My sister Linda and I took a look at that and other black people in the school, and particularly the cute black boys. <laughs> and we looked at each other and we knew before we even set foot in that school that we wanted to go there. So we went back and I tried to tell my dad that it was gonna be cool, you know, just leave it alone. I mean, the school was great. I mean, it was like a small, you know, college campus compared to our school and they had all the great equipment for our athletics and everything, especially the gymnastics. They had gymnastics equipment set up like 24 seven. And I, it was only gonna be for a year. I said, it's just a year, dad, we'll come back. But he wouldn't hear it. He didn't wanna let it go. And so, um, court stuff ensued, legal drama and everything, and I was old enough to decide for myself. And I had to stand up in a court with a judge looking down at me and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so I said yes, and we wanted my dad to leave my mother alone so that we could move to Lansing for the year. I hated doing that. I hated the steak dinner that the lawyer took us out for to congratulate us. My steak tasted and burned. So we moved to Lansing. And I was trying my best to try and make sure that the, uh, the visitation and arrangement that my parents has was maintained. And every other weekend, I would drive myself and my siblings to visit my mother, my, my father, because I was old enough to drive. And <laughs> one time I foolishly drove home to Lansing on I-96 in a blizzard doing 90 miles an hour to catch a phone call from one of those stupid boys. <laughs> he never called. Um, but I don't know, we, we just got caught up in the activities in the school. It was a great school and there was more going on there than there ever was in our school in Windsor. And, and I thought we were going every other weekend and I don't know, maybe we missed some. And I don't know, I thought I, I tried to make all this stuff up. And all I know is that I was working really, really hard to, to help my mom and take care of my siblings and make sure that we got back and forth to Windsor and, and still go do get, get in, in my classes and, and my sports and, and make new friends in my senior year in high school. And it seemed like everything was going really well. It seemed like I was holding it all together. Until December 26th, 1977. And my father called me on the phone. And I picked up the phone and I said, hi, Dad. And my father proceeded to cuss me out for about 10 or 15 minutes and ended with something that sounded pretty much like, I'll be goddamn if I'll let some motherfucking little bitch who thinks she's grown ruin my fucking life and you are to no longer consider yourself any fucking kin to me. Click. I was 16. My sister Sherry, who was there at the time, said that I was a different person when I got off the phone. I didn't know who I was. My, my world crumbled. I, I, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I, I all but quit school. My mother would ask me to come and talk to her and, and, and discuss the things that I was going through. And whenever I would try and do that, she would tell me about all of her problems and how much worse were things going, were going to be when I grew up. I didn't want to grow up. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. Once I tried. Fortunately, I found something that I wasn't that good at. <laughs> and through the years, I have struggled to try and find that 10-year-old girl who knew that she could do anything again. I try to give kindness and love out to the world, not the anger and hate that I grew up around. I have raised a son on my own as a single mother, partially because I never wanted a child of mine to go through a divorce and partially because my own scars still have me picking the wrong men. Although I am still good friends with my father's, my son's father. I didn't manage to protect my siblings from my parents. We're all kind of messed up in a way, each in our own way, but we're doing pretty well and we're, we're very, very close. Um, like the Borg from Star Trek, my sister Linda would say. <laughs> I mean, my family ties were knots that almost strangled me, but ultimately they're all that I had to hang on to. Now, I look upon 
every single day as a fabulous gift and a blessing. It took my parents almost 40 years to come to some sort of accord with each other, but they're both doing well. This year, for my 53rd birthday, I spent the afternoon with my mother, even though I didn't want to be at a funeral for my birthday. And I spent the evening dancing with my father in a neighborhood nightclub and imitating his little quirky dance style, just like I did when I was a kid. I, am, I love both my parents so much. And I am so lucky, blessed, fortunate, whatever, to still have both of my, my parents with me. And how many people can say that at this age? <laughs> I have really come to understand the irony inherent in a poem that I read when I was in sixth grade about a man who built walls around him to keep everybody else out. I've learned that those walls can trap you and keep you from getting out. And I have been trapped by my anger and my fear of being hurt quite that way again. And I'm hoping that by finally telling this story and re releasing some of that anger and some of that fear, and that I'll finally be able to like open myself up to real, genuine relationships and be able to step outside of myself and and really go after some things that I want to do in my life because I've let fear keep me from doing many things. And I just heard that Bill Cosby is having another, going to be doing another TV show. And I need to step out because I want a lead role in that. Leslie McCurdy.